Man, take a look at this beautiful chicken fried steak served up on a bed of home style mash and a cream gravy to go over the top of this. Hey, good eating right here. Check this recipe out. <laughs> You're going to love it. Well, hello. Welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode of Texas Cooking Today, we're going to be making some chicken fried steak. Chicken fried steak is a southern favorite. It is delicious crispy, crunchy batter on the outside of a beautiful piece of beef with some tasty, creamy cream gravy over the top of it and some home-style mashed potatoes. That's just delicious cooking right there. And I'm going to show you how to do every bit of it and how to do it the right way. So come over this way. Let me show you these wonderful ingredients that we have and I'm going to show you how to make the very best tasting chicken fried steak you have ever put in your mouth. Come over here. Now, as you can see, we have a wonderful assortment of goodies here. King of our dish, of course, is going to be the chicken fried steak. And for that, you can use any cut of meat you want. You can use a ribeye steak, a strip steak, you can use chuck, you can use uh, round, whatever you would like. Now, I have here Eye of the Round. This is wonderful because it grows sort of like just a long round muscle um, and it allows you to cut good round shapes from it and that makes a good chicken fried steak. Uh, also, if you are using something like a ribeye, you're going to want to cut off that excess outer fat. It's good to have some of the intermuscular fat, but that thick outer band you're not going to want cooking up underneath batter. That's just not cool. Okay, so we're going to take these and prepare them for cooking up, and I'll show you exactly how we do that. To batter that up, we're going to want a nice crunchy batter that holds up good to heat. And the best thing in the world is what's called a buttermilk batter. So here I have buttermilk. I'll be using considerably more than that. And also we'll be using some flour. And we're going to be using these two items to produce a good, strong, sturdy batter to fry with. It's a wonderful tasting batter. I'll be seasoning that meat, of course, with some black pepper, salt. Also in this dish we're making cream gravy, so I'll be using some milk for that, flour, and a bit of butter. And we're going to make this wonderful tasting cream gravy. It's basically a, a white sauce is all it is. And it's a very simple way of making a simple white sauce that can be turned into a lot of things. But for this dish we keep it simple. Potatoes. I'm not going to peel these. We're going to do a country style mash that has little bitty lumps of potato in it and has bits of skin in it and it comes out fabulous tasting that way. So we're going to be doing that with these. I'm going to show you how to do all of that and we'll be cooking up our steak of course in some olive oil or excuse me not olive oil but uh, peanut oil. We always want to use peanut oil when we're frying at high temperature unless of course you're allergic to peanuts to something else. It's a wonderful tasting alternative to vegetable oil or canola which basically has no flavor. Now let's get right on to taking care of our meat and getting it ready to cook this fabulous tasting dish. The first thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and glove up and that's because it makes cleanup just a little bit easier for me. And also if you're cooking for somebody else and they see you do this, they're going to feel a lot more comfortable about their food. Now what I want to show you here you don't have to use a meat tenderizer to do you can use the bottom of a simple pan and that's what I'm going to do. You can also use a, one of those meat mallets. That works fine. I don't like the size of the head on those. I think they're a little bit small and it makes them sort of uh, difficult to work the meat out. I like to use something like this. It gives me a nice smooth wide surface to work with and it uh, tenderizes the meat well. If you don't want to make a mess, put your meat inside of a plastic bag or under some plastic or under some foil. That will work also. You have a lot of options there. Now what I want to do here, just go ahead and work this out. I want to get kind of rough with it. You see how that meat sticks? It kind of makes it a little difficult. So, watch what I want to do here. I'll put it inside of this plastic bag. And what the plastic does is it allows the meat to kind of spread and slide across the plastic. At the same time, it doesn't stick to this. Now, 
Now, normally on YouTube, they don't want us talking about things such as pounding your meat on camera. However, this is one of those special occasions when I actually get to say to the viewer, yes, go ahead and pound your meat. And, and, uh, and, and I'm not breaking any of the rules. It's just wonderful, I tell you. Okay, all the men are laughing and the women are going, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. Now, if you've noticed, I've gotten rather brutal with this, and that's okay. You can do that. It's not going to hurt it. Some meat can really take that. Okay, now, what this has done is it's pushed those fibers apart, and it's tenderized this a lot, and uh, it's going to make it cook up a lot easier. And I brought this down in thickness quite a bit. I'm going to bring it down just a little bit more, but this type of tenderizing works great. And it also helps to keep that meat from seizing and pulling up as much inside of the batter. You don't want the meat to release from the batter. Now, let's go ahead and get our meat seasoned. And I'm going to start with the salt. Let's just take a pinch of salt, hold it high, and give it a nice coating of salt. And the reason we hold it high is to allow it to disperse a little more evenly on that meat, okay? which we got right there. Now, of course, salt goes everywhere, but hey, big deal, right? A little pepper. Flip these over, and I'm going to do the exact same thing on the second side. Immediately after I season my meat, I go ahead and put it down into some flour and give it its first coat of flour. Once this is done, I can set the meat aside if I wish, and it will hold its spice, and it will be ready to go anytime I want to do it. So, Now, I'm going to have to go ahead and cut up my potatoes into smaller pieces to be boiled. Now, when I want to cut this, the first thing I want to do is choke up on that knife a little bit, meaning that you're going to want to move your hand up from the grip back here to where the blade is. And if you will take these two fingers and pinch that blade, that gives you so much more control on that knife, and it'll keep the thing from rolling sideways on you, okay? So I always tell people, choke up and wrap these back fingers around the handle here, and that way you have a good, strong grip on that blade. Now, especially when you're cutting something dense like this, you're really going to want that kind of control. So what I want to do is take this potato, we're going to split him in half, but I'm going to split him in half from this direction up here. It's a little harder, but just a gentle glide through the potato. We don't make it difficult. And now I'm going to cut this into thirds on each one, and about three quarters of an inch long pieces. Gives me these nice little chunks that will cook up well and that will also process well. We have our potatoes in hot water and boiling. Now, these potatoes are going to boil until they become hazy and tender. And I'm going to show you the exact condition to take it to. Now, these are some russet potatoes. And white potatoes and red potatoes and russets all cook at different speeds. So I'm not going to tell you how long this takes because also some potatoes could be fresher than others and those potatoes are going to take a little longer to cook than older potatoes will. So if I told you how long this takes me to cook, it would likely be wrong for whatever potato you're using. So instead of that, we're going to show you the condition the potato needs to be in for it to be right for mashed potatoes. Now I decided to go ahead and show you a way to test your potatoes, and this is what we're going to be doing to make sure that our potatoes are cooked enough. We first have to pull it out and look at the potato. And when we do, and we look at this piece of potato, we notice it has sharp edges on it, and sharp corners still, and it still has kind of a, a sheen to the outside of it. If I push my fork into it, it holds onto the fork real well. That potato is not yet cooked, okay? It needs some more cooking to go. And I need to take it, as I mentioned before, to a state where it looks a little bit hazy on the outside and the corners are starting to degrade somewhat that's when it's ready to go ahead and turn into mash. Now the potatoes need to be checked again. This has been uh, about, oh, well, just several minutes of cooking. I'll say it that way. I don't want to say times because I want to teach you how to look at the potatoes and know. 
Now, first of all, some of the potatoes like this one are starting to split. Good indicator right there. It looks a little more hazy on the outside of the potato now. They don't have that sheen to them anymore. When you push your fork into it, they break apart easy, and the part that's open looks much more dry inside. See here? Very dry looking inside of it. And uh, so it has that white hazy kind of mashed potato look that, that makes for good quality mash. This is exactly what we want, where it gets kind of flaky like this, like a good pie crust gets flaky. And so that's a good potato for mashing. Now all I have to do is take these, pour this into my food mill, and then I'm going to mill it straight back into the same pot. It's a wonderful way of doing this. You don't have to use a colander or strainer or anything like that. The food mill is a great way of doing this. You're going to love it. Now, remember have your food mill set up and ready to go. Just pour the potato straight into it. Once that water finishes draining on through the bottom there, all I have to do is put it right back on top of the same pan I boiled in. No mess, no fuss. It works great. Okay, now if you wish, you can scrape out what's left in the top of the food mill there. Personally, I'm just not going to worry with it because we have to move on with this show. Now, look on the bottom here. Oh, that beautifully milled potato. Soft, fluffy, and perfect. And my butter. Go ahead and put butter in here. Go ahead and put some salt in this. Remember, potatoes are salt thirsty. It's not going to hurt to add a little salt. Our sour cream. And I have a uh, probably about a third of a cup there. And all I cooked up there was just one large and one medium potato. I didn't give really any poundage, but we're talking about maybe a pound and a half to two pounds. My oil is now coming up in temperature. It's almost at 325, which is right where I want it to be to do this. I shook off the excess flour. Now the idea of a good crust on a chicken fry is having plenty of flour on it. So what I'm going to do is I floured it first to get more of the uh, buttermilk to stick to it. And I'm putting the buttermilk on it to get more of the flour to stick to it so it makes a nice thick crust. So down in the buttermilk. Oh, there we go. Makes that nice thick coating on it. See there? Right in the flour. Now, I'm going to give it a simple shake. That's all you have to do. And it will coat both sides of that chicken fried steak. Now remember, the other ones are still underneath it in there. So I pull this guy out. He's double coated. And he's ready to go in the oil. Well, we have the last chicken fry doing its thing. It's cooking up. And down here in a pot, I have heating some butter and peanut oil. And I have placed three tablespoons of butter and three tablespoons of peanut oil into this pot. And I'm going to bring it up to temperature. Now, after my butter melts completely, I'm going to be adding in some flour. I've got a quarter of a cup of flour. Whisk that flour in. I want the flour to cook for a little bit so it doesn't have a raw flour flavor. This will foam up, and as it foams up, it's doing the right thing. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called a roux. And the roux is a good way to start a lot of sauces, especially like a white sauce like this. Now I've re increased this to a medium low heat. And I want to bring it up to a boil. And as soon as it does, we're on the way for cream gravy. Now I'm going to start by salting this just a little bit. I want about a half a teaspoon of salt in there. And we're going to put some black pepper in it. A 
both of these ingredients are going to be adjusted later on but I'm going to be putting anywhere from about a half to three quarters of a teaspoon to start with of this black pepper. I'll simply bring that up in temperature. As it thickens, I'll know how much more of my milk cream mixture to add. Starting to bubble again. And that's good. I really don't need to cook this beyond this because we already cooked the flour when we made our roux and uh, the uh, milk and cream mixture doesn't really have to cook per se. Uh, it just has to thicken up to where we need it and it's right there. And this is beautiful. Right, there you have it. Chicken fried steak and it's delicious. I tell you what, this, this is staple food in Texas, okay? This is absolutely delicious. I guarantee you, you're going to love this dish. Give it a try. The recipe's fantastic. Just cut this open. See the meat? Just slightly pink inside. Cooked up just perfect basically a medium well uh, is what I have there. Mm -hmm. Mm. A beef steak wrapped in a wonderful crust. Mm. With this fabulous gravy. Delicious and simple. style mash. This is just fantastic. The whole dish is just one of those that you you can't forget once you've had it. And that's the reason so many people that have been to Texas later on seek out how to make chicken fried steak. Because they know how good it is. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. Thank you for watching this episode. And please, if you haven't subscribed, please do. I have great shows coming out all the time. Good stuff coming your way. To my subscribers, a special thank you to you. And you folks, you have a good day. Thank you for watching Texas Cooking Today, the show where you can get great recipes and the best techniques are taught. Please subscribe to Texas Cooking Today, where you will always find something hot and ready to eat.